Hello and welcome to part 2 of the series of videos about Hvarena of Good and Evil. Last time we talked about what Hvarena is and where it came from, we talked about the Hydro Archon's influence in the Girl of the Sands during the Cataclysm, and about Renee's investigation notes and the story from the artifact set Nymph's Dream, so the Nazis and Hoyts Institute of Fontaine. Today we're completing the series with everything we learned about Karia during the war quest Hvarena of Good and Evil, but also thanks to the countless hints scattered around Sumeru that we've been finding ever since version 3.0. Like last time, if you haven't played this war quest, you might want to come back later unless you don't mind spoilers. As always, this is a theory video. I use information available in the game, but my theories and deductions are the fruit of my personal research and interpretation, so they're not to be considered the official lore of the game unless I got something right and it is confirmed in later updates of the game. Alright, it's time to start the video. Let's talk about Karia by analyzing and chronologically organizing every single text we've found since version 3.0. In my previous video, we talked about two people who were traveling together until one of them acquired some kind of knowledge and he became the evil dragon, so the other friend, the hero, fought against him and slew him. Although victorious, the hero stopped believing in anything that human knowledge could not comprehend, and decided to build a nation powered by machines without relying on the gods, so Kanria. We already know, since early game, that Kanria was being built back when Dragonspine was still a lush mountain, most likely less than a hundred years before the Celestial Nails came down and destroyed Salvindagnir and many other ancient civilizations, just like the evil dragon told the hero before dying. If you want a deeper look and theories about the dragon's monocle, you can watch Harena of Good and Evil Part 1. Fast forward probably millennia, the people of Karia built multiple workshops to study and use Azazite as an energy source. One of which was a royal machine workshop Gnade, which in German means mercy or grace. But when it was officially abandoned, the last Azazite powered workshop was the one in the Girl of the Sands. These workshops had been shut down because King Ermen, the last king of Karia, seemed to have discovered a new perpetual energy source by spying on the secrets from beyond the skies, most likely forbidden knowledge. The people who worked at the workshops, though, didn't think that this new technology was perfect because, although the four pillars of Karia had achieved such prosperity thanks to these secrets from beyond the skies, they didn't trust neither the gods nor the demons, and they believed that only human will could pry open the corners of this hollow world. So they requested Marshal Anfortas of the Shrine Rita to petition the king to allow them to keep manufacturing some machinery according to the old standard, as a side so that future generations may take up on their research. So, does this mean that Karia was intentionally trying to break the VAT back then? Anyway, the researchers proved that the new technology was too unpredictable and in most cases, like the production of field tillers, the ruin guards, Azazite power cores were more convenient. They realized that if Azazite alloys formed a matrix, they would provide enough energy to power even the ruin columns. They were convinced that human intelligence was superior to some dogma from beyond the heavens, but despite that, they knew they wouldn't have been heard. Fast forward again, the cataclysm started and something happened to Ermin, which made him indisposed and unable to keep ruling, which feels a lot like he was cursed. That's when Marshal Amfortas became the regent of Caria and began to lead the Regnum Concilium Ultimum, translated the last or ultimate Council of the Reign. This new information, together with the message in the break from version 2.8, tells us something really clear. Amfortas belonged to the Albrecht clan, which also means that he could potentially be Clothar's father. Because of the Cataclysm, most people fled above ground with the Schwanenritter under the orders of garrison commander Hadura using the rune golems, while a few stayed in Karia, like the one who wrote the ancient journal, who decided to stay in Karia with their mother because she was probably too weak to run to the surface. On the ancient journal, they also wrote about people who went above ground and then returned, bringing news about some Karian who were suddenly afflicted with a strange disease and turned into monsters. Following the story of those who fled, one of the ruin golems stopped working in the desert of Adramabeth, in which we found a letter of one of the Schwanenritter in his last lucid moments. His limbs were like ice and the warmth in his vein was seeping out from his ravaged form, until he wasn't able to finish writing the letter. Another member of the Schwanenritter, Hildrich, died under similar circumstances, that is, multiple organ failure. I do have to say that this doesn't really make sense. 
The people of Caria were either cursed with immortality or with the curse of the wilderness, and both curses prevented the people from dying if not by someone else's hand. Although we could say that the unnamed soldier's symptoms were caused by his transformation into a monster, so he may not have actually died, how did Hildrick die of multiple organ failure? That shouldn't have been possible. I mean, even Dainslev was completely surprised when we found Clothar's body buried in the forest and that was because Clothar wasn't supposed to be able to die. Anyway, garrison commander Hadora, the one who sent out the orders to evacuate the people of Kanria, was commanding the rune golem that we found in the Valley of Dahri in the Great Red Sand. He was given the title of Sentinel of the Golden Hall by Marshal Amportas for successfully leading the operation to stall the Beasts of the Abyss. After Hadura's Ruin Golem stopped working too, the remaining personnel was relocated to Amportas' Ruin Golem, the last operational golem, while the wounded were left behind in a safe zone due to the limited transportation capacity. Amfortas' Ruin Golem managed to reach the Vantaka Mountain, where they met the Sumeru Academian Darshan led by Nagarjuna and fought against the beasts of the Cataclysm together. This earned the Shvanerita the title of Heroes of Dahri. Of the three remaining Shvanerita, we know that Ungiltr, the damsel of the Dale, were missing in battle. Of her, only the signet ring and something else that we don't know remained. So Amfortas thought that she died, but we know that she didn't, because she was transformed into a shadowy husk and went back to the Golden Rune at the Vantaka Mountain. There, we also found proof that Marshal Amfortas executed Hadura for betrayal because he caused irreversible damage to a certain machine, and in the fight between the two of them, Amfortas lost an eye. We don't really know what happened to Amfortas after that, so let's talk for a second about Amfortas in literature. Amfortas, in the Arthurian legend, is the Fisher King, the last king tasked with guarding the Holy Grail. Because he was wounded in battle by most likely the Lance of Longinus, he had trouble moving. His um, intimate wound, let's say that, affected his kingdom as well, now barren and devastated. He used to spend his time fishing in the lake next to the castle and many wandering knights tried to heal him but to no avail. Only the Chosen One, who will become the new guardian of the Graal, would be able to heal him. That happened to be Parsifal, one of the knights of the Round Table, who healed the king just by asking what his problem was, basically. Anyway, if Scaramouche didn't say that he was a royal mage, I would have thought that Amfortas was Fierro. You know, a noble Canrian, because he was cursed with immortality, with a mask that covers his right eye completely, as if he lost it. Now, as we've seen in my last video, the divine bird Simurg fell into the Amrita pool and shattered into countless Kvarina. Some of them received the gift of intellect and became the Pari. And the first Pari was Surban, who found the golden hair masked swordsman from Kanria, whose elf body had become that of a monster and was holding a ring tightly in his hand, which was probably a signet ring belonging to someone important to him. Zurvan brought him to the Sea of Flowers and when he awoke, he told her that he managed to survive because he had been cursed. Zurvan and the swordsman, who is obviously Dainslev, traveled together and fought against the beasts of the abyss until a one-armed sage from the Academia, Nagarjuna, who retraced the hero's path to the Girdle of the Sands, joined the fight. They entered the Karian's ruins where they found machines that fought against the abyss and that belonged to the heroes of Dahri, and Nagarjuna used documents left by the heroes to find a path through the darkness to the Harvest Potokum, where they used the Amrita to purify the land and the sky. From that moment on, countless Pari were born and the monsters disappeared. The Academia Darshan then founded the Order of Skeptics together with apparently some Karians and later Dainslev left with a young woman with golden hair just like either, so Lumine. Which means that we now know when they started traveling together or, better yet, when Sasti sent her back to Tavat. Sometime later, an investigation team from the Academia arrived to explore the secrets of the Dachrians. They wanted to enter the runes despite the skeptics' warnings, so Nagarjuna sent Klingsor, a member of the Order of Skeptics and Hadura's descendant, just in case something happened to the team. Little did Nagarjuna know that Klingsor couldn't actually stand him because he thought that he was spreading lies to save the world, so Klingsor decided to bring out the truth. He thought that his ancestors, the people of Kanria, fought against the heavenly principles but were rejected by the laws of the world and unjustly cursed. 
Once inside the ruins, Klingsor found some documents, Renee's investigation notes, which I explained in detail in part 1, left by some people who went there long before them, and he realized that he could have found a power that transcended even the power of the Abyss itself, the power of evolution, whatever that may be. Suddenly, during the expedition, the team was attacked by abyssal monsters for unknown reasons and many of them vanished while trying to flee. Klingsor disappeared without a trace as well, bent on fulfilling his own personal mission and revenge, while the few researchers that were still alive were left alone to fight against the abyssal monsters without any help and meet their inevitable demise. Klingsor apparently accepted the defilement's blessing and turned into an abyss herald, Wicked Torrents, who later went to the Sea of Flowers to seal Survan's great song of Kvarena. He summoned countless monsters of the abyss, but the party and the humans managed to defend the Volukasha Oasis. The last piece of information we have is that later, for unknown reasons, Nagarjuna decided to enter the underground ruins of Kanria and never came back. This whole story about the people of Karia brings up quite a few questions about the curse, but also a theory that I've been carrying inside and never really said before because it felt like a random thought up until now. I don't think the heavenly principles actually cursed the people of Karia. it was Erman's fault. We thought that everything that happened was Ryan Daughter's fault, but we just learned that the power from beyond the skies, forbidden knowledge, was brought to Karia by Erman in order to create a perpetual machine. This reminds me of how the Shred uses people and shared forbidden knowledge straight to their minds without them knowing he was going to do that in order to have a chance at understanding it. If you think about it, Ermen was a pure blood Karian, so if his indisposed state was him being the first person to be cursed, then it would make sense that people got different kinds and levels of curses based on their relationship with their king. Pure blood like him got immortality, his soldiers became shadowy husks, and the people who sided with Karia turned into monsters. But I do think the heavenly principles also play a part in it. Think about it, we have proof of another person who had nothing to do with Karia but was transformed into a monster regardless. Ukko, the scribe of the kingdom of Salvindagnir, the named lavacher on Dragonspine. He lived in a hotspot in the Envoy Age, one of the places where the Abyss and the Forbidden Knowledge were leaking from the rifts of Tevat, as we learn from Apep. Uko was the last person of the kingdom alive, so he was probably exposed the longest to forbidden knowledge. Then there's the celestial nail that for unknown reasons broke so its power was leaking as well. We learn from Nahida that the celestial nails have the power to stabilize powers that shouldn't exist on Tevat, transforming them into something that Tevat can make sense of. So, if a person is corrupted by forbidden knowledge and you want to stabilize them in a different form, they would probably turn into monsters. Do you remember the story of the first Sili? Well, it also fits perfectly with this narrative. As we said in my last video, the Sili incident happened at the end of the Envoy Age, so with the mending of the rifts of Tvat with the Celestial Nails. The Sili was cursed, it lost its mind and memories and its body was transformed, which really does sound like what happened to those who came in contact with both the Forbidden Knowledge and the Heavenly Factor, be it the Nails or the Heavenly Principles themselves. But its body also shattered, which makes sense because we now know about Simurg, a fragment of another Sili, Nabu Malikata. So, most likely, the disaster from the Sili story was actually Forbidden Knowledge, which not only cursed the Sili but also destroyed two out of three moons. Another potential proof of this may be the Shred's people. They were contaminated by Forbidden Knowledge, but they didn't turn into monsters, because they weren't exposed to any heavenly stabilizing factor and the issue was more or less solved by Ruka Devata. So, they were left contaminated but not stabilized, meaning they got Elazar. By the way, to further prove that the Sili, Hvarena, the Abyss and the Shades all came from the same power, the fact that Haftan was able to appear like it did means that the Abyss Order was right. The ruins of the primordial civilization, created directly by the Shades, did have the power to cure the curse. Otherwise, Haftan would have just disappeared just like any other shadowy husk. Since Haftan absorbed the power of the device straight into his body, he was simply cured of the curse, which is why Dainsef was surprised to see him as a memory ready to go back to the ley lines, which we know that cursed people can do. Now, the curse takes me to the next issue. We read that some people stayed in Kanria while others fled with the Schmannenritter. Those who stayed, as far as we know, didn't turn into monsters. 
Some of those who fled didn't as well and were able to go back to Karya, while others who fled did transform. We could think that those cursed with immortality didn't really understand that they were cursed because why would they? They didn't know what was happening in the first place and immortality isn't really a visible curse like turning into a monster. The problem comes with some of those who fled. We know that Caribert pretty much turned into a Hillager right in front of Clothar, so it happened really fast. But then Ungild of the Schwanenritter fled from Canria, arrived at the Vantaka Mountain, fought with the heroes of Dachri, and then she went missing and turned into a shadowy husk. We also have Klingsor that poses an even bigger problem. He was Hadura's descendant, and he seemed to be fine. He fled from Karya, went to the Vantaka Mountain to fight, and came back to the Girl of the Sands with the scholars. He fought there as well, became a member of the Order of Skeptics, and only when the other scholars arrived and went into the ruins, he joined the Abyss, not the Abyss Order that was founded more or less 200 years later, and turned into an Abyss Herald. How does that even happen? This only confirms that the heralds are not the result of the curse, but of an intentional and direct agreement with, most likely, the sinner. And in the monster hierarchy, they are way above any other Kanrian monster. Although, Anjo, how did someone like him turn into such a high-ranking being? Moving on, this has always lingered in my mind because it was way too sus. When Dainsleif told Halfdan that Kanria didn't fall so that his spirit could go in peace, he concluded with No need to revive the homeland. This has never made sense to me. Halfdan wasn't trying to revive Kanria, if anything, he was the one who stopped the Abyss Order's plans. And he didn't even know that Kanria fell. It also doesn't make sense for Dainsleif to tell Halfdan, especially after he disappeared, that there is no need to revive Kanria if he just told him that Kanria didn't fall. I've always thought that there was more to those words and after reading that some people stayed underground and others went back, Karia probably still exists, like it's still inhabited somehow. Now let's talk about the gate of Karia. Around it we can see this huge half bust of this strange being that looks a little bit too much like a shadowy husk, but I have no idea what they may be. Then there's Ehrman's Eclipse symbol that also appears on the back of the Abyss Mages, and two more decorations. One is this gladiator shadowy husk that we don't know. It could be a hint at a new Electro or Danger Soldier, but he looks a lot like Atlas, the Titan from Greek mythology. Atlas fought against the Olympian gods in the Titanomachy, and because the Titans lost, he was punished to hold up the heavens for eternity. He's identified with the Atlas Mountains in Northwest Africa because in the myth he stood at the end of the known world, and he was attributed the invention of the first celestial sphere, which fits extremely well with Genshin Impact, I would say. The last and extremely visible decoration we see is the infamous eight-pointed star that we've always defined as the Star of Ishtar, that keeps appearing throughout the game, especially in relation to Karia and the Traveler. Now, another potential explanation could come from Gnosticism, which is the main belief system the writers used as a reference for the whole game. In early Gnosticism, it was thought that the world was created by Sophia, one of the 30 hypostatic ideas or emanations called Eons that were projected by the Primal Father, the true god of the Pleroma, which is the fullness, the totality, probably oversimplified as the universe. Sophia was the youngest emanation and she was curious and passionate, which led to her fall from the Pleroma and the creation of the imperfect world and of the imperfect humans. According to Gnosticism, what separated the Earth from the Pleroma were the seven celestial spheres. Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, the Sun, Venus, Mercury and the Moon, each presided by an archon. Later, another Gnostic called Valentinus said that above the seven heavens was the eighth one, the Sphere of Fixed Stars, where the mother of the Archons, Sophia, resided. If we believe that Tevat, the whole microcosm that is, was capsized, then the seven heavens, the nations of Tevat, are at the bottom of the world. As a consequence, the eighth sphere, the eighth nation of Tevat, is Karia, which is underground since the eighth heaven is the closest to the Pleroma, that in Genshin Impact would be the actual Celestia, the one for the loading screen. And according to Gnosticism, the eighth sphere isn't ruled by an Archon. This may be what the eight pointed star may be hinting at. Do you remember Atlas from before? He was attributed the invention of the Celestial Sphere, which seems too big of a coincidence at this point. 
Now, although the 8th sphere is supposed to be ruled by Sophia herself, I don't think that Karya had a mother god that we don't know of. But I do believe that they rejected the Archons because they may have found proof of the existence of the Primordial One. Although in this case, there should be an even higher god, which is something I've already theorized in the previous video. As well as I've theorized that the Primordial One may be a woman, specifically Lilith, and now we're talking about Sophia, but that's beside the point. This theory would explain why the people of Caria researched and used the power of the Abyss, especially considering the fact that I believe that the Sinner is one of the Shades, more specifically Phanes, the one Shade that was born from an egg but never hatched from it, meaning that he must be still inside Tvat, but also the one Shade that disobeyed the Primordial One and created a microcosm instead of releasing the world on the Old World, hence the Sinner title. On that note, there is one potential theory behind the Sinner that I haven't talked about yet. The Sinner may not be a bad guy. Okay, so my thought process is simple. Why would the Sinner use its power to cure Caribur from his curse? If it's evil and it's transforming people into monsters to do its bidding, what use is there for one of those monsters to be cured in the first place? Then, if Nabu Malikata had the opposite power of the, of the Abyss and she was a Sili, so probably a higher being closer to what the Shades are, wouldn't it make sense that a Shade as well would be able to erase the curse? So, if the Sinner is actually Phanes, which I think he is, it may have accepted the Primordial One's punishment and it may have tried to help the people of Caria who got cursed on their own by acquiring forbidden knowledge, but being punished, as shown by the chains, it can freely use its power, so it was able to cure just one kid. The problem then is that the people, who on multiple occasions have shown to be really dumb, mistook what it tried to do and they now believe that they have to acquire its power to go against the whole world. Again, it's just a possibility that I thought about, nothing too serious, but it would be nice if I got it right. One last thing, probably the most important one, the nation of Kanria itself. So, we already knew that it was an underground nation, so it's no surprise that the gates are underground, but here's what troubles me. In the We Will Be Reunited video, we saw Lumina arriving at Caria and she saw the nation being destroyed by flame, lava and the cubes. What has always troubled me is the fact that she's on a cliff above ground, with grass, trees and the sky behind her. We all probably thought that, because it was being destroyed, whatever acted as a ceiling of the underground area had been destroyed and that made sense. The problem is that the key to Caria is in the middle of the Girl of the Sands, so no grassy cliffs at all. The gate points toward east, so there may be a long path before we actually get to the nation itself, much like the serpent's bowels in Enkanomiya, but going that way we find a river that goes straight to Fontaine and some mountains. Unless they didn't care too much about the low quality and released map, there's really no indication of the destruction of the Cataclysm in that direction. Furthermore, those who stayed in Caria said that they remained underground, so it doesn't seem like they lost the ceiling of the cave. And by the way, I say cave because the name of the sub-area where the gate is located is called Hange Afrasiab, and in Iranian mythology, the Hange Afrasiab is the name of the cave far from cities but near water where Afrasiab, the king of Turan, spent his last days after being defeated by the armies of Kai Khosrow in eastern Iran. So back to Genshin Impact, things aren't adding up. The only explanation I can think of is that Caria is both underground and in a domain, like those that actually have a sky for some reason, which would explain why Lumine was on a grassy cliff. In that case, the gate in Hange Afrasia may be just like any other domain gate, only four times taller. Lastly, if the low quality map is even relatively reliable, then where is Marijivari? I mean, it has to be between Sumeru and Natlan because it's supposed to have both lava and sand, which exists only in those two nations, and on the eastern side of the Girl of the Sands, there's just the ocean. I guess the map will change drastically in the future, especially because I believe that Marijvari was the above ground result of the destruction of Caria. Honestly, at this point, I just want to go to Fontana and get my answers, like right now. And that's it, I hope you liked the video. If you did, don't forget to leave a thumbs up, and if you enjoy Genshin Impact Theory videos, consider subscribing. Writing and editing these two videos used up all the brain juice I had in me, but I do feel satisfied by the end result. Now I think I'll finally be able to start researching for the video I wanted to do for a long time, but like I said in the community tab, I think I'll try streaming a little bit as well. I'm still finishing the starting screen of the stream, but I don't think it'll take too long, at least I hope. 
Well then, thanks for watching and until next time, over and out.